Welcome to another video in the fine print series. This will cover the details of brake pads and brake rotors. Now, if you haven't watched my video called the fundamentals of braking, you should probably check that out because I'm going to skip over a lot of the basics here that you need to know to make this video more concise. Now, if you've already seen that, strap yourself in, whether it's on a porta potty, your bed, skydiving, hopefully you're going to learn something from this. So let's get started. All right, let's talk about brake pads first, like these. And almost all of them contain a metal backing plate and a friction material that's attached to it. Now, they come in different shapes, different sizes, different lengths, different depths and colors, and you know where I'm going with this. But the main science behind designing a brake pad is the friction material. That is what clamps onto the metal disc or the cast iron disc. And they use a wide variety of different materials from organic material like this. This is on almost every single street car. And that is because they're, the focus on cars that you go and buy from the dealership are almost always low dust. They don't make a mess, low noise. So they don't squeak and instantaneous bite at pretty much any lower temperature. So you could take your Toyota Camry out and go in freezing cold, hit the brakes and you feel the car stop. And even when you get them heated up to like 200, 300 degrees, you can still feel confident that the vehicle will stop. And that's all because of the pad material that they've designed in here. Now, much like oil, much like tires and rubbers and all of that, there's not a one size fits all thing for all types of heat ranges. And the same thing goes with brake pads. You can't take this street pad that comes on a, a car that you buy and go heat it up to a thousand degrees on a track or in the mountains and expect the car to stop the same way because the pad design is more skewed towards normal operating temperatures, freezing and just moderate driving. And that's where a lot of the science comes in behind different types of pad materials. All right, let's get a little bit more technical. I talked about those organic brake pads that are on your car from the factory. Well, when they're designing brake pad material, they use a chart called the coefficient of friction chart, or mi. They're using the Greek letter from the alphabet, M. Some people call it mu or mu. I'll let the English people tear it apart. But when you look at this chart, and I'm gonna put one up here, it's very simple. It's about a temperature range from freezing to about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're gonna look at that pad material and you're gonna look at how much coefficient of friction it has from zero to 1.0. And obviously 1.0 based on this chart is how much bite that that pad's going to have at that specific heat range. And that's how you know where you're going to start to have a problem with braking. If you're operating a high temperature pad in freezing, it just doesn't work. Likewise, if you use an organic pad from your on your street car from the factory and you try to heat it up to 1500 degrees, well, your car's not going to stop either. And that's really all these coefficient of friction charts are going to tell you. All right, now that you understand that coefficient of friction chart, you need to understand different types of pad materials, and it's really not all that complicated. When I talked about an organic pad material, well, what does that mean? It means it uses different types of fillers. It uses glass, Kevlar, carbon, and binders such as resin to hold it all together. It tends to be a softer pad material with not a very high heat range, but again, it's about low noise, low dust, and longevity. I would never put that on a car like the Atom, but you're damn right I would put it on a car like my 98 Civic, a masterpiece. And you know what? I want to drive my Civic 150,000 miles and not have to touch the brakes because I don't care about stopping like a maniac. I'm never going to drive it crazy. And that's what most people want from a car. And of course, there's other benefits to having just those types of brake pads aside from cost. Now, the other type of pad material that is extremely popular and you're going to see it touted at parts stores or your mechanic are ceramic brake pads. And ceramic brake pads are just what it sounds. It uses fillers and ceramic materials bound together. And they're excellent because one, they're quiet. And two, they don't have a lot of brake dust. So when you're braking, you're not getting wheels and you're all dirty, especially. And they're really good at pretty much all the lower temperature ranges compared to your organic brake pads, and they do tend to last a lot longer. 
but they are not good at higher temperatures. So again, much like organic pads, they're more skewed towards that lower temperature range, the street temperature range where, well, most people live. Your next brake pad type is a semi-metallic. Just what it sounds like, of course. There's more metal content in the pad material. You have zincs, you have coppers, you have steel wools, and then you have binding agents, of course, and some lubricants like graphite to balance it all out. And a semi-metallic provides more clamping force. It's more metal-on-metal -metal contact with the cast iron disc. And this is also gonna have the side effect of having a much higher temperature range. So while there are some, it's a, it's a good balanced pad because you'll, you're still gonna have good bite at the colder end. So if you're in freezing temperatures, this will still work to a certain extent. But if you're heating them up a lot, like downhill driving, mountainous driving, or some higher performance driving, you're gonna have a higher heat range. So they won't fall off. You're still gonna have grip at, let's say, 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, where with an organic pad, you might kind of max out at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, this pad material is good, a, a very good balance, but the side effects are more noise, more brake dust, and the costs can be higher. Now let's get on to the next pad, which is called a full metallic or sintered pad. And this is kind of the next step up. It's more metallic content. You have carbons, you have zincs, you have uh, coppers, you have metals, and every brake pad manufacturer is going to have their own proprietary material that they're not always going to share with you. They might give you that coefficient of friction chart, but they may not tell you specifically how they do it and all the binders and all that. But for the most part, just know there's more metallic content in it. And a full metal pad is going to be great for ultra high temperatures. And take a look at this chart from Hawk. You can see how the race pads will literally go up to about 16, 1700 degrees Fahrenheit before they fall flat. That means you can get on the brakes, you can be hard on them on a track, and you're gonna have consistent high levels of bite and friction from those pads. But on the lower end, forget it. They don't get heat into them until like two, 300 degrees. And of course, on the street, you're never gonna get heat in them. So if you're trying to run a very aggressive metallic pad on the street, what you're gonna do is you're gonna wear out the pads, they're just gonna disintegrate and dust, and you're gonna wear out rotors because it's just gonna eat away at that rotor from operating outside its heat range. So the next part to talk about with pads is kind of, you hear this term fade. Well, what the hell is fade? Well, fade is just the brakes stop working. You have a firm pedal, but the car is not stopping. And that is almost always because your pad is operating out of its heat range. It's just as simple as that. So that covers the basics of brake pads. So now I hope that gives you a better understanding of the different types of pads. And then the next obvious question is, well, what's the best pad, Mr. Goose? Well, I'm gonna tell you the sad truth. There isn't one because it's highly dependent on a few factors. One, the type of car you have. I can't take the DTC 35 or 30 pad out of this Atom and go put it in my 4,000 pound Mustang. You know why? It's not gonna hold up to the temperatures that that car is exposed to. I would have to go to a higher temperature pad. Likewise, if I took a higher level pad that was designed for a heavier car and put it on the Atom, it wouldn't stop because I would never get enough heat in those pads to operate efficiently. So you have the weight of the car, you have different types of tire compounds, the stickier the tire, the hotter the braking temperatures, you're gonna put more heat into the brakes from those tires. I mean, it's just, there's so many different factors involved. Now, the next part is brake dust. You know, I have Hawk pads in the Atom. I really don't like them. Honestly, they feel great, but it has corrosive brake dust. And it's the type of uh, pad material that they use that when exposed to water, air, moisture, all those things, it can cause pitting in the wheels and you have to keep it clean. You have to get the brake dust off metals pretty much instantaneously before it starts to eat away at it. So I typically use Carbotex on my other cars because yeah, it will have brake dust, but at least it's not gonna destroy my wheels. And it just, again, it's another factor. What's the best brake pad for you? Would you rather have the better feel or less brake dust and corrosion, less noise? I mean, there's all of these factors involved. The next part is compressibility of the brake pad. And this is one that a lot of people don't talk about, but that pad material can be compressed much like anything. It's like your pillow. If you have a super firm pillow, well, that may be better for you, 
but if you hate a firm pillow, you would want a softer one. And what's my point? Well, the point is the same thing goes with brake pads. Certain brake pads will compress under braking force. So if you're pushing that pedal, there may be that little bit of slop that you're feeling, a little bit softer feel in the brake pedal, and that might drive certain drivers nuts. They can't stand it. They want a hard brake pedal all the time. So you'd want to go for a brake pad that has less compressibility, that was harder. So again, it depends on your driving style. And the more you drive, the more you learn at what makes you better or faster, or most importantly, more comfortable. And that is the thing why nobody can ever give you a straight answer of what's the best brake pad for your car. Again, it depends on you and what you like. Sad part is brake pads are expensive. Once you get into more, uh, you know, super sports car type pads or higher temperature pads, you could be paying two to three to four hundred dollars for a front set of brake pads depending on your car. That's a lot of money to be testing out and experimenting to find out what you like. So again, if you have questions, post it in this video and we'll try to answer it. All right, now you know all about brake pads, probably more than you care to know, but I tell you this, when you go in your local Long John Silver, and you go talk to somebody there, you can tell them all about compressibility, pad material, they are going to be blown away. They're gonna give you a free pizza, I guarantee it. It works for me all the time. Now it's time to talk about rotors because that's really the next part of this and you wanna know more about it. So I covered this in the fundamentals of braking and I'm gonna recover it this time talking about the pros and cons of each. The first, the most mainstream rotor you can buy is a ventilated disc with a flat rotor face. This is what's on like 95% of cars, if not more. And when you look at it, just a flat face, super quiet. There's not a lot of pad noise. There's no noise that should be generated from these. And you have ventilation in the middle that's non-directional, which means I can put it on the left side of the car or the right side of the car, doesn't matter. The big pro of these discs is they're mass produced. If you buy a Impala or a Corolla, you can literally go to the parts store and buy it for like $25 a piece or $30 a piece. And I'm not kidding you. And some of the track guys will literally buy these because some places will give you a lifetime warranty, take it to the track, destroy them, and then swap them out. Again, cheap, cheap, cheap. And that's what you want for a street car. You don't need fancy discs unless you have some special usage case. Now, the negative parts of them, they're not capable of a lot of heat dissipation. They just don't bleed off heat that well. Of course, by design, that's not really what they're there to do. And the second thing is they're very heavy. You have a, a one-piece design with a cast hat, a cast iron hat. It's all built into the one piece, so that's where you mount it to the hub. So again, weight, if you have a more performance car, you care about weight. If you don't, well, just keep driving on them. The next discs are all basically identical to this. The only thing they're doing differently here is they're putting, well, let's talk about the slotted rotor. They put little slots or kind of cuts into the rotor face. And what this does is it helps with pad scrubbing. So it's constantly giving a place for that pad to bite into. Secondly, it's scraping that pad off. If there's any pad material that's built up on it, it will scrape it off and keep it fresh. The next thing it will do is it somewhat prevents outgassing or helps with outgassing. So there could be gas that's built up between the pad and the rotor, and that gas has some place to escape. And this is not that big of a deal, honestly. The last one is water dissipation. If you got some water between the pad and the, the, the groove, there's a place for the water to go. Um, the big problem with a slotted design is it depends on the rotor manufacturer. If you have a slot that runs too far to the trailing edge of the disc, it's a place for the rotor to crack under heat cycling or heat checking. And I'm gonna talk about heat checking here real quick before I move on because it's relevant. Heat checking is when you heat cycle a rotor too many times. So what is heat cycling? You take a rotor, you heat it up to like 1300 degrees, hot as hell, and then you let it cool off to room temperature. And you do that over and over again. Eventually, you're gonna to start to have these little microscopic and little tiny cracks all through the face of the rotor. That's what's called heat checking cracks. And it's not really a big deal, it's just the normal part of metallurgy, what happens when you heat and cool metal a lot. But if you have a slot that's cut too deep, depends on the rotor design, and it runs too far to the edge, it's a really good place for that crack to extend through that slot and break a rotor. And obviously, if you're on track or in really serious driving situations, you don't want a cracked rotor. So that's one of the negatives to it. And all the negatives apply to that type of rotor to the regular ventilated disc I talked about. 
The, the next rotor design, same thing, except there's no slots in it. They drill holes into the face of the rotor. The only thing it adds there is one, it's aesthetically pleasing, and that's why most people do it. drilled rotors is they look cool. The second thing is it does is it, there's more airflow through all these like cheese holes in it. And that's great until you really start driving this car hard or the, the car hard with the braking system and you start to plug those holes up with pad material. And I had this problem with my BMW. Go to a track, drive hard, and now there's pad material plugging all the holes up. And the side effect is, okay, now you lose the cooling benefits and I'm getting pulsing in the pedal because there's pad material all over those, those little, little divots and it's just annoying. The next thing is, as you would expect, heat checking cracks. You're getting all these little cracks all over the rotor face. The best place for those cracks to go through is all the holes. And it, that's why you see a lot of these cross-drilled rotors cracking so much easier. The more holes you put in, the worse it is. And the less surface area there is for that pad to grab onto. Now in the same vein, you can take those identical rotors I just talked about and certain manufacturers will cryogenically treat them. Oh, and I know that sounds so fancy, about as fancy as me wearing woman's lingerie. But other industries have used this, like the tool industry and certain manufacturers will treat gun barrels to the cryogenic process. And the concept is to stabilize the metallurgy, to make it more consistent. So in a high-speed application, like a gun barrel, as the bullet leaves, there's less movement in the metal. So the, the bullet will go out more true instead of rotating or moving. Now with brake rotors, obviously, it's kind of the same thing. You put them in liquid nitrogen, or you treat them in a liquid nitrogen, you lower the temperature to negative 300 degrees, and then raise it up to positive 300 degrees and let it cool back down to room temperature. And it's all about the same thing, making the metallurgy or the metal more consistent. It's almost like an additional curing process. And there's a bunch of science behind it, honestly, but what they're hoping to do is to keep that metal more true to temperature deviations, to bending warping, and it's more used in kind of the commercial industry, and you can do it on performance cars, but honestly, I've used them and I found little to no difference. They still crack, they still heat check, and if you're using a really hard metallic pad, it's gonna, the same thing is gonna happen. And the price difference I found wasn't really worth it. Now, if you're using a softer pad on maybe like a, a truck that you need longer service life out of the rotor, it may be beneficial. But again, it's about pairing the right type of pad with those types of rotors. Now, those are all kind of your one piece rotor designs. Then you get into a two piece design, which is kind of like this. The rotor is separated from the hat. And this is what you want on a performance application. The hat is typically aluminum. It mounts onto this rotor to save weight. An aluminum hat is way lighter than a cast iron hat. And the two-piece design allows you some flexibility just to replace this guy instead of the whole disc. And in a performance application, you can save a lot of money doing that. The next thing with these is, you know, once you get to a big brake system, and that's typically what this is, this is an AP racing disc from Essex Brakes in North Carolina, and they supplied me pretty much with all my brakes. I'm a huge advocate of them. Um, they just, they're not selling crap, and they're, they're making brake systems for people that really want to drive their cars. That's not for aesthetics, it's for performance. And when you look at brake rotors like this, you get into like a directional uh, vein design, which you can see here. There's more cooling veins, there's more directional veins in them. So it's now you have to put it on the right side of the vehicle. If you put it on the wrong side, you're, you're not creating the airflow that you need to. The second thing is they use J-hook uh, design here instead of just standard slots. And you'll see this on other brake rotors, like these Alcons on the Atom have a similar design, but again, it gives it more of a, a place for the pad to like bite into with these hooks. And they're placed strategically where it's not gonna crack the face of the rotor as easy. So that's why you would go to a disc like this. Cost, more cooling, uh, a little bit better design, and they have proprietary metallurgy, which is the metal composition of this, which is more resistant to cracking and other things that you see with cheaper rotors. But again, this is more of a performance application. Uh, the negative parts about it, of course, are the fact that well, to buy into a system like this, you have to change your caliper. You have to change pretty much your whole braking system to include this. And that can be a major pain in the butt. But where it's not a major pain in the butt is carbon ceramic discs. And people are nuts for these because they're on supercars. 
And carbon ceramic discs have the benefit of having a high carbon uh, carbon material in it, uh, but they are super resistant to uh, cracking as easily, but they are also extremely delicate, but they have a great temperature range. It doesn't take as much time to get heat into them before they work. So that means they typically run cooler. Uh, you can have higher braking performance and they, they are amazing when you use them on the street. You're, you're so blown away by that instantaneous bite and the force they generate. But like everything, they have their problems. And that is, like I said, they're brittle. You have to wear gloves to handle them because you can get splinters from the material. And they can get pitting once they start getting out of their temperature range, once they get overheated. And mostly on the track, hardcore driving is where you're going to start to see these things crack and break apart. If debris hits them too hard, they can get brittle and you know chip away, and they're super expensive to replace. Most cars are like three thousand dollars or two to three thousand dollars a rotor, and this is where this is the Essex disc is a good option for somebody that has a carbon ceramic because Essex actually makes a disc replacement for a carbon ceramic disc on some cars. So you can take the carbon ceramic disc off, put a regular steel rotor on there, and then you know, drive like you didn't have carbon ceramics and save a ton of money. And that's mostly for people that are driving on the track. On the street, they last a long time. Now, the other part of the, the carbon ceramic equation is you can't use a, a steel or a, a metallic pad. You have to use a very specific pad type to work with a carbon ceramic disc or you'll destroy it. All right, now you are falling asleep with more information that you want. The last point is you have pads and you have rotors. And one of the most important things about those two things is you have to have them bedded or you have to have the rotors burnished. And what does that mean? Simply is it's about creating a pad layer on top of the metal disc. You get all the, the pad layer built up into the pores of the metal face of the rotor. And that way the pad is riding on top of the layer that it's created versus just friction material on metal. Now you want to do this because a few reasons. One, it quiets the braking system down. You're not on metal on metal contact, you're riding on that pad layer. The second thing is, is it reduces pad wear and rotor wear, because you're not, again, you're not eating into the metal of the rotor with as much pad or friction surface. So that's one of the key things that people don't do and they don't understand about a braking system. So to bed a braking system, really, you take the pad, you take the rotor, hopefully they're new, you go out and you do a bunch of repetitive stops from like 60 to 5, 60 to 5, until you get enough heat into them so that pad layer is created from the pad to the rotor. Once you do that, you should have a gray or a bluish layer across the face of the disc. This will prolong the longevity or prolong the life of the disc and the brake pads, it's gonna quiet them down and this is how you get the optimal braking performance from a high performance system. For street pads, you know, it doesn't take as much heat to do this, but you should do this in all braking systems. And again, it's all about making sure that pad is riding on its own layer versus just kind of metal on metal contact. And I hope that helps you understand the finer details of brake pads and rotors. I'll see you next time, thanks.